Hello, everyone. It's good to be here together this morning. We have a great opportunity to lift our voices in worship. Would you please stand? Let's sing together. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. consider all the sacrifices in every war and I try to grasp it all come to grips with it stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves I am 
am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families, serving their country. I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom. One airman who knew the cost and went anyway. One man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many. And the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Good morning and welcome to the Bridge Church. My name is Sarah. Um, whether you're joining us in person or virtually, we're glad that you have chosen to join us on this Memorial Day weekend. And as we remember those who sacrificed their lives for our freedom, uh, we also want to remember the families who are grieving because of that sacrifice. Um, and we want to be a church who grieves alongside you. If you are new to connecting to the bridge, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And whether you are a first-time guest or have been a part of this community for a while, we want to stay connected with you. And one way we can do that is through our communication card, which was on the inside of your program when you, that you should have received on the way in. You can also scan the QR code on the front of your program, or you can go to our website to fill it out online as well. Um, I'd just like to encourage everyone to take some time um, to fill it out sometime during our service this morning so that we know who all was able to join us. And please include prayer requests um, so that our prayer team can be praying for you throughout the week. Today, Adam Condit will be our guest speaker again um, as Sue and Jerry are on their second week of vacation. Um, Adam will be speaking on Set Your Mind on the Spirit from Romans 8, 5 to 11. Now I want to encourage you to pull out the announcement insert on the inside of your program. Um, Summer Bridge Building will be, uh, sign-ups will be starting up this week, and Lane Jordy will be coming up a little later to share about the many exciting opportunities that we have for you this summer. This Wednesday is the, um, Wednesday, June 1st, is the women's tea. Um, the women of the bridge are invited to join other women from the bridge from 10 to 11.30 a.m. at the bridge offices for a time of prayer and connection. And you can sign up for that in the lobby this morning um, after the service. And then next Saturday, June 4th, is Leah Bump's graduation party and the church is all invited to attend her graduation party. It will be at the Bump Home, uh, and you can find the address on the announcement sheet here. Um, Leah is just one of a few different um, graduates that we have, and so it could be a great way to just come alongside her and celebrate with her as she launches into this new um, phase of her life. Before we continue on with our service, I want to invite you to stand um, and pray with me for our time together. Jesus, we thank you for the freedom that we have to meet together this morning to worship you. Lord, as we remember the sacrifice of the many American soldiers over the years, um, may it also remind us of the sacrifice that you made on the cross, Jesus, so that we could experience the ultimate freedom and life in you, Jesus. God, um, as we think of sacrifice, Lord, we grieve with the families of Uvalde, Texas, whose children and family members were murdered in the senseless mass shooting this past Tuesday. Jesus, we pray for your comfort, for 
these families at this time, Lord. God, we pray for your intervention and for wisdom for us as a nation and how to address these continual mass shootings, Lord. We pray that through these tragedies, Jesus, that people would see a greater need for you and that your Holy Spirit would bring people into relationship with you. God, we lift up Adam as he gives the message today. Lord, I pray that you would guide his words, that he would be sensitive to your spirit's leading. Um, God, I pray that we would have open hearts for those of us listening, that we would be encouraged and challenged as we worship through song and through Adam's message. Um, God, we thank you and we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing a new song to us um, today. It's called Hallelujah for the Cross, and it's just a... um, It's a great song to say thank you um, for the cross. Thank you for what you did to God. Um, And it's it's a good reminder um, of the truth of Scripture, Um, reminding ourselves that by his stripes we're healed and by his death we do live. Just thank you for the cross. goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross. You have won me with your kindness. Chase me down when I was lost. Where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? Hallelujah. Thank you.
are good, you are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love. On display for all to see, you are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true, even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing, you are life, you are life, in you death has lost it. Good morning. Um, 
I am Lane Jordy, and I have the privilege of being the growth group and bridge building intern. Um, I get to work alongside Sue Kellen um, to form, facilitate, and fill growth groups and bridge building groups each semester. Um, bridge building groups are a little bit different than growth groups. Um, bridge building events are designed to provide social spaces where we can build and deepen relationships within the bridge family. These also provide safe and relaxed opportunities to invite friends who may not know Jesus yet. And that is what we are doing this summer, is bridge building events. Um, so, in just a minute, I'm going to start going through the um, 18 opportunities that we have this summer, which is a very high number, so bear with my voice. Um, but before we get into those, I just wanted to remind you of how you can sign up for the groups. Um, you can sign up on the app. Um, in the lobby, we have all sorts of clipboards and papers, um, and we would love to talk with you out there, um, or on the website. Um, so, with that, let's look at the growth groups. If you don't have a program, this would be a great week to get a program um, and follow along um, on the bridge building insert. There is a lot of information and I am not gonna take up all of Adam's time this morning, so I'm not going to go through every detail. So um, there will also be slides behind me um, with pictures of the leaders. So please follow along um, so that you know what is going on. Okay. For our first bridge building event, we are gonna have Guys Golf. We've done this in the past and it's exciting that we get to do it again. Um, this will be on Sundays um, at four o'clock in the afternoon and this will be for men. Um, bridge building group number two will be pickleball. Another opportunity, please have your program, um, make a change because this will not be on Tuesday, June 14th. This will be on Sunday, June 26th. At the same time, same place, all the other information, excuse me, information is correct, but it will be a different date. Um, group number three, we will have a women's prayer group. This is continuing from um, the spring. We had this group um, and we're excited to be able to do it through the summer to pray for um, families and friends and ourselves and the church. And this will be um, on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. And this is for women. Um, group number four will be a women's movie night um, with Rachel Orff on June 15th at 7 p.m. And group number five is seven parks in seven weeks. This is for moms and children um, on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Um, at different parks throughout town. Uh, group number six is a grown and flown get together. Um, so this is for parents that have adult children. Um, and this will be on Friday, June 17th at 6.30 p.m. with the Nelsons and the Kellens. Um, and group number seven, there's three options for this one. Um, this is picnics in the park. Um, the first one will be on Tuesday, June 21st at 5.30 with the Coddingtons. Um, the second will be Thursday, uh, July 7th with the Witchkeys. And the third will be Thursday, August 4th with um, Jens and Indigo Brown. Group number eight um, will be Wednesday Walks, and this will be for women on Wednesdays, hence the name, um, and we'll be meeting at different parks and trails throughout town um, to meet and talk and exercise with other women. Um, group number nine will be Eau Claire Express Family Night. This is for everyone. Um, all ages are invited on Friday, June 24th um, to watch the Eau Claire Express. Group number 10 will be Evangelism Basics with the Keppins um, on Sunday, June 26th. Um, we also have uh, men's bonfires on Tuesdays. Um, Tuesdays at the Doherty House with Luke and Adam Condit, and then Friday at the Condit House, and that is, again, for men. Um, on, we also have, group number 12 is the Praise Jam, which is Thursday, June 30th, um, and that's open to everyone. Um, we have group number 13, which is the women's pool party at the Whittacombe household on Monday, June 11th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, group number 14 is the family brewers versus twins game, and this will be an opportunity to go to Minneapolis to watch the twins and the brewers play on July 12th. 
Uh, we have our annual pool party um, for the whole church. This year we get to have some snow cones, hopefully, um, at our event. Um, this will be on Sunday, uh, July 17th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Group number 16th is our um, another annual event, our Faith, Fierce Freedom Justice Run Walk, and that's um, on Wednesday, July 20th at 6 p.m. at Carson Park. Um, group number 17, Afternoon at the Pool. This is for women and children, if you have them. Um, this will be on Tuesday, August 2nd at 1 p.m. at Fairfax Pool. And our last group is the Downtown Farmers Market and Splash Pad, um, another event for women and children if you have them. Um, but we would love for you to come if you do not have children as well. Um, and this will be on Wednesday, August 17th at 10 a.m. Um, I myself and a few other people will be at the table after service um, to help with questions and sign-ups. And so please come and visit and take a minute to sign up. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Condit. I'm going to deliver the message today. Before we do that, a couple quick housekeeping things. Um, another quick announcement that's coming in that we want to uh, let you guys know about is the appraisal on the new building that we are new to us, the building on Claremont that we've purchased. The appraisal has gone through uh, a little earlier than we thought, and so that doesn't really give me a specific date for you, to, for you to know about a move-in date or anything like that, but we just want you to know things are moving well. Um, everything that was kind of in our job jar has been done, so we're just waiting for some of the, you know, some of the accounting and, and some of the financial stuff to go through after the appraisal is done, which was really good news, huge answer to prayer. So there's a quick little nugget for you. We're going to keep the communication going as we get uh, into the middle of summer. All right, uh, with that, Bridge Kids, you can go ahead and stand up. Start making your way towards that door for your Bridge Kids time. And before we get going, I will open us in prayer. Just so encouraged by uh, what we have going on at this church in the, in the summer. It is, it is a good thing to have kind of that big rundown and know what the, the bridge building uh, groups are. All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us this time together. Thank you for giving um, us this building, us these facilities, these resources, this microphone. Uh, I pray that you would just use it all to your glory. I pray that you would um, continue to take us out of the way and, and put yourself on full display, God, whether it's Sunday morning or throughout the week. I pray that you would have a particular time um, for this message and that you would give us ears to hear. And I am just reminded of your power. As we hear the thunder outside, it's just peanuts. It's nothing compared to um, what you continue to do in lives, in Eau Claire, and around the world, God. Give us, give us eyes to see and ears to hear you this morning. Amen. All right, so as a quick side note as well, your insert, your insert does have all the scripture on it today that I'll be going through over in Romans 8. That's in the ESV translation. If you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to be in Romans 8, um, and I'll get there in a little bit. But before I do that, let me just introduce you to my favorite food, pizza. Pizza is by far my favorite food. Uh, my family, it, by pure, I don't even like this word, but coincidence. We didn't plan out, we didn't plan out actually having the best pizza in town, Sammy's, last night before I got my intro here, has a little bit about pizza. It just happened to be the case, and so my mind and my gut is still just going really strong on Sammy's pizza. But there is one other pizza that Alicia and I were able to get to in Chicago when we went a couple, uh, week and a half ago for some work. We went downtown Chicago, like blocks from Lake Michigan, downtown, right on the Magnificent Mile, Paisano's, thick, right? Sammy's in town here, nice thin crust pizza. It actually holds together pretty well, but you talk about a thick pizza, crust on the bottom in Chicago, deep just style, that fit the bill. 
okay? Only had to eat one piece, ended up eating three pieces. But the deep dish gave us a foundation for what we put on top of it, okay? So here's the sermon transition. We're talking about what we're going to set on a foundation. I'm actually going to come back to a little bit where I left off last week, which was actually um, in a different book of the Bible. We are in Matthew. Let's actually go to slide three. I want to read a verse that we were in last week that kind of links to where I want to go today about having our mind on the Spirit. That's what Romans 8, the beginning of Romans 8 is, is, is about. But let me remind us in Matthew 16, we talked a lot about our way and God's way. That was last week's recap. If you weren't here, that's what we talked about. Our way and submitting to God's way. Okay? And through that, we saw this with Peter. Peter was essentially describing, no, we need to do it our way, God. You keep describing these weird ways that you're going to go to the cross and die, but we need to do it our human way. And, and Jesus has some pretty frank words for him. He turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are of a hindrance to me when you have that mindset. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That's where we're going to go today. What do we set our mind on? What is a mind in the scriptures? Is it just the brain? Peter didn't set his mind on the things of God. He had his mind on top of the things of man. And that's where I want to go with the pizza crust analogy a little bit. I know it's kind of funny. But that deep dish, everything that we were throwing on top of it, it could hold. Because we put it on something that was meant to hold all the toppings, all the everything. Very different than my seven-year-old's approach to pizza, which is to not really care about what the pizza actually is and dump a mountain, a Mount Everest of Parmesan cheese on the top. That's all she cares about. The flimsy stuff on the top. And she just kind of licks it and doesn't really get to the pizza eventually. She's not all about that crust. She's got a flimsy view of what dinner is supposed to be. And we've got a little bit of a picture. We can have a flimsy view of what our worldview is even and what we're putting our mind on. Something that can hold everything we're throwing at it throughout the day, throughout the pandemic, throughout our lives, throughout this tough season for some of you. We need something to put our mind on that'll hold, okay? It's very intentional. We put our mind on something. The other thing I want to just put out there before we get into Romans is it is really easy for me, and so maybe for some of you, to think of this particular time where the news is going crazy and there's tragedy, and we have a lot of different news outlets telling us a lot of different things, and we have social media, so we can kind of get this fire hose of information, And that is different in some ways. It's different. The amount of content thrown at us is a lot, more than it used to be. But the propensity to always be wrapped up in something new is not new. It's something that we always struggle with as humans, is to see the new thing and to see what we think about it and get the hot take and get opinions and argue and have this just kind of continued to be unsettling. The Bible talks a lot about anxiety before the internet was around. And they all play together, but this is not something new. I want us to look in Acts. Before, see, Paul started talking about the gospel and about Jesus dying. And there's this town square, there's this market square where people would throw out ideas. This has always been the case, even before the internet. People would get together in pubs. It literally called the market square because... In the town square, that's where people were. It was the square where people hung out. And they talked about this philosophy and this philosophy and what's right about this and how this isn't right. It's always been the case. And Paul's like saying something new and they want to bring him in and see what he says because they're hearing something different. I'm actually going to go there because I put up a verse here that's helpful, but I'm going to read just a little bit before that. Before they actually ask him to talk, (laughs) they're literally saying like, What does this babbler wish to say? Like, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. He was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him in, brought him in, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? They actually want to know. So there's different ideas. There are conflicting worldviews happening all the time. 
And this struck me as I read through that. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. I have no idea what that feels like. People just talking about the newness of the day. The new ideas, not even new ideas, just the news, like new is in that word, news. There's always stuff coming at us, and it's important to be informed. Don't get me wrong. This is not about putting our head in the sand. But there's always a fire hose of newness coming at us, and this, this has always been the case. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Aragopic, Aero, excuse me, Aeropagus, said, men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are very religious. What does that mean? We think of religion maybe as a place like this, a place of worship and faith ideas. Now, he was coming to them with the gospel. He was coming to them with news about Jesus. And he looked at them, and it says elsewhere as well, that he saw their idols. He, and back in those days, idols would actually be something you held in your pocket, maybe. Something that you could see that you would put on your nightstand, maybe. Something that you would see morning, noon, and night. And he would look around at their behavior and how they would go to the newness of the day or the news of the day. And he would say, you're acting very religious. So we're going to splice out today. What does it mean to be religious in the way that Paul's talking about it? What does it mean to have our mind on the flesh, and our mind on the spirit, okay? We're going to take it a step further from last week, which we just talked about God's way, God's design, and our way, our design. We're going to talk a little bit more about living in the spirit by putting our mind on the spirit. Let's go to the next slide and get to Romans here. If you've got it in your Bible or in the handout or up on the screen here, let me just read verses 5 and 6 to start. We're going to be 5 through 11. Romans 8, one of the great, um, I mean, if you could name a single chapter in the Bible that's got some weight behind it, I cannot get to everything that's in here, even in the passage that we have. Uh, we just can't flesh everything out, but I do want to pick out a couple things. So Romans 8, verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So there's just these, this contrast. And I want to take apart verse 5 real quick. Because I think this can be really misunderstood when we look at our context and we talk about spirituality, spirits, faith, this overarching, like, what's... What's out there and not understood in material means? Because that is prevalent in our culture, for sure. For sure. Even the Enlightenment and even like all of the you know, scientific method and everything coming down through modernity in a postmodern world has actually gone uber spiritual. Uber spiritual. We are of science fiction culture, we're of a spiritual culture, maybe, I mean, I'm not talking about necessarily gospel-centered Christianity and the risen Christ and the spirit that he provides, we'll get there, but I'm just talking about spirituality is something that our culture does not deny in general. Okay, live according to the flesh or to live according to the spirit. Let's pick apart verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So this, to me, in one verse, gives us a good bridge of not just pontificating about spiritual things and then having that be disconnected from what we actually do in our lives. How we live and what we put into action is downstream of what we set our mind on. And that matters. That matters. There are so many false dichotomies that we come across, especially online. I just have to pick 
on social media for a while. I did last week a little bit. I, by the way, I'm on social media. I use it for business. I use it for keeping up with friends. I used it to buy something on Facebook Marketplace this week. I'm not against social media. There is a particular barrier to ingesting the social, the, the, the town market square. I don't think it's a good market square. I don't think it's a good town square to debate philosophy. I think it's more like a coliseum where people fight and then most of the people are just looking and some of them wanted to see a fight and some of them didn't. It's just, it's a coliseum. This is not a Christian perspective, by the way. Jonathan Haidt, who's an atheist with a Jewish background, does not affirm the gospel. Really interesting conversation and article that he wrote. He had a conversation with Russell Moore, who is a Christian. They talked a lot about this day and age and how social media and the internet in general has quite literally, I'm going to use their words, don't come after me for this wordage, made us stupider. And the main thing is how we engage important complex ideas. We have put it in the Colosseum rather than maybe the living room or a coffee table face to face, the nonverbals. And we made it about winning and conquering and observing. And it's a huge challenge. But as Christians, we're not called to get away from the public square. How do we engage this? How do we engage this? Because I saw this week just... Before I get to that. This verse connects action with where our minds are. And that's important. We believe as Christians we're going to put our mind on something. And we're called to put it on the spirit, which will affect our life, which will affect those who live according to the spirit will put your mind on the spirit. So, I mean, I could make this about behavior management and tell you all my tips and tricks about maybe what your morning routine might be more healthy like, you know, like I do think it's important with the first thing that we put our eyes on. Now, I'm not going to put barriers around like the amount of time and when you have to get up in the morning and what news app you should or shouldn't look at. Like, that's just, go to God and have wisdom and discernment. But I do think putting our mind on something first thing in the morning will dictate how we maybe do the rest of our morning. And that might be downstream from how we do the rest of our afternoon. Like, if we start in a place of chaos and public square nonsense, that might not be putting our mind on the spirit, which we're called to do. I've had to really fight against this and put limitations and boundaries about what my cell phone even pops up with news, the whole thing. And methods aren't everything, we're going to get there, but to put our mind on the spirit is what we're called to. That's what we're called to. The flesh, downstream of the flesh, is death. Downstream of the spirit is peace and life. After this week's news, can we just agree that peace and life is what we're after. And if we believe in the good news of the Bible, and we believe this is going to dictate what's good for us, in context, in our culture, of course, setting our mind on the spirit, it tells us, leads to peace and life. This is helpful for me. This is helpful for me. We are so quick to be put in camps. We are so quick to be put, you know, Camp A versus Camp B. As if all the complexities of what's going on this week or last week or whatever, of all the complexities of important, important, actionable issues can be summed up in a meme. I, I think this is a place for, we could speak truth into those, into those memes. I think if you know someone, it's helpful to be face to face, to just speak truth into places that are not speaking the truth. As if we need to choose between taking action or having thoughts and prayers. I will say unashamed that our worldview believes in the res resurrection of Christ, believes in a spiritual worldview in which spirits exist, in which the Holy Spirit is engaging in our lives. And prayer affects how God interacts with us. 
And he also affects, according to verse 5 and a bunch of other verses, how we live our lives. This is such a false dichotomy to talk about, are you team prayer or team action? It's not biblical. Are you team gun or team mental health? What a false dichotomy. As if this can be summed up in a meme and posted within the first week of this. This is a time after something like this happens, in my view, reading the scriptures to humble ourselves and realize maybe a meme doesn't have the perfect answer. We're going to get to what we believe the true and better root answer is in some of these complex, tragic times, including the pandemic, including things that are medical, including things that are scientific, as if a meme, if I can just finish off my so social media soapbox, as if a meme is going to change anyone's worldview about anything that's important. And I believe I've posted memes before. I hope about, like, fart jokes and things, but not <laughs> things that are important. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to verses 7 and 8. The point with verse 5 and 6 is that our lives and what we do is affected by where we put our mind. Let's talk about this problem. Let's talk about this problem of even wanting to put our mind in something else. We're born with a mind that goes towards our flesh. Last week we talked about our way and God's way. That, that's very much mirrored here with putting our mind on the flesh. It's how we're born. And that's definitely how all my babies and toddlers acted. Putting our mind on what we want to do in our flesh and self-preservation. Even though it's cute, that's how we're born. As opposed to putting our mind on the spirit. Verse 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is like the start of the gospel, actually, even though these, these are the most challenging verses for me of anything that we're going to see. This is kind of like, it seems like bad news, and it is a difficult condition that we're born into, and we're going to follow it up with the good news of what Jesus does with us, but let me just reiterate that this is not a religious problem that we have. Let's talk a little bit more about religion and the way that Paul saw it. Paul looked at that culture and said, man, you guys got a lot of opinions, you guys got a lot of idols, you guys got, you, you have a lot of man-made tools. You have a lot of things that you're coming up with because there is a problem, there is a separation between us and God, there is dysfunction in the world. It's not going away. There's this problem that we all sense, and when something really tragic happens, we all know. I mean, we don't have to get into the debate and the back and forth about is there only particle materials and is there good and bad, evil. We all have been shown the testimony of God being good. There is good and there is evil, and it is on full display in our creation. That's a given. That's like just a given, and where do we go from there? Where do we go from there? There is a cosmic problem that we cannot, without God's grace, we cannot please him. This is not about finding a better human policy. This is not about finding a better human means, a better work of the rules. God has put forth a perfect law, and we cannot do it. I'm not saying policy is not, not important. Of course policy is important. Of course policy is important. At the bottom of it, at the bottom of it, as God ordains us to have structure and to have governments and to have policy and to be smart and to have wisdom about human flourishing, we will interact with that. We will have action in that, absolutely, 100%. But the fact that we need all that is a testament to the fact that there is a condition that's completely broken. And we can look on the other side and say, they're broken, we're not broken, which is what my flesh does. And we can set up camp against this camp, Team Red, Team Blue, Team America, Team Non-America, team, team whatever. We set up camp. I mean, you could go on social media and say, the grass is green, and there'll be two camps about that discussion. No true statement is safe when it comes to the polarizing camps that we can so quickly go to. And what we need to see in the Bible is we're all starting in the same camp anti-God. We got to get common ground. 
When you actually want to have a good, productive debate, argument, whatever you want to call it, discussion, when you want to involve your worldview for the good of someone else, you want to be productive in discussion, a very, very effective way to do that is to get common ground. Is to get common ground. Make sure you understand what they understand. Make sure you can articulate. I got this from Tim Keller, pastor up in New York for a long while. Make sure you can articulate their point better than they can. Just so you're on the same page as what they believe. Common ground. Here's our common ground as humans. We all oppose God. We all oppose God. And we, in fact, cannot please him. We got to get to the good news here. This is, a li- this is the starting point of the gospel. We have a broken condition, and we oppose God. Let's go to verse 9 and 10. It's all right here. 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. The full gospel. 7 and 8 and now 9 and 10. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. He's describing Christians. So there's something that was done. There's something that was done for people to be in the spirit. We'll get to that. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. But one thing I want to point out, it talks about the Spirit of God dwelling in us, and then the verbiage changes next time we come up on it on verse 9 to the Spirit of Christ And then verse 10, but if Christ is in you. So there's a couple different descriptors of how God is in us. And putting our mind on the, remember, all this came from putting our mind on the spirit. And I don't want you to misinterpret that or myself to misinterpret that to think it starts with us. I need to have this perfect plan of how my morning goes and put my mind on the spirit. And then God will find favor in me and then he will come and dwell in me. That's not true. That's not true. We're going to get to what Christ did for us. But this is, very loudly speaking, of how closely Christ is with us, and it is a testament to Christ being the Son of God, being God, being part of our triune God. Okay, so there's a mystery here with how the Trinity works, and I don't have it all figured out, but this is certainly a passage that we can look to to say, okay, the Spirit of God, for Christians, when you have your mind on the Spirit, to be in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, and then it's referenced as the Spirit of Christ, and then if Christ is in you. Okay, so you could probably set up a whole semester (laughs) discussion about that, but all I want to get to is Christ is in here somewhere. Christ is in here somewhere, and he is the perfect bridge between spiritual reality And what God is before the creation, and then where we find ourselves, the creation. We're in this debased, broken creation. And Christ is in there somewhere. Christ helps us bridge the gap to this perfect God and this broken creation. Christ is a God-man, as you could say it. Fully God, fully human. Okay, so he's the only one that can help us here because we need help. This is not about human religion. This is not about human policy. This is about the power of Christ. We're going to get to that in our, next, in, our, in our next verse. But before we go there, stay on verse 9 and 10. Stay on verse 9 and 10. I love the new song this morning. I love the new song this morning because it describes us being in bondage to sin being held. So the cosmic problem of we cannot get to God, we're held captive by sin. This condition has us. This condition has us. This is not about us figuring figuring a tunnel out. And God's solution is Christ. So we see this full gospel in the trade that happens when Christ goes to the cross. We have bondage from freedom. Let me just jump ahead real quick. Bondage to freedom. In 
chapter 8 still, verse 21 says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. So we're set free from, we're set free from corruption and saved to obtain freedom. This is different than just having a better policy, having better rules, and sticking to the rules. This is the Christian worldview. We need rescued. We need deliverance. We need help. And Christ here in verse 10 is our help. This is the trade, sin for righteousness. And let, let me go to verse 11 here at the end here of our, of our scripture. I've already said that we're not talking about a better human policy. P policies are important. God essentially, before we get to the policy, before we get to what man can do better for human flourishing, we need God's power. This is a story about God providing power to the creation to even see him. Providing grace through faith. There's this channel of faith. We have a faith. There's a channel of faith. Grace through faith to provide us power. This is amazing. Before I read verse 11. Before I read verse 11. A couple months ago, we had a guest speaker named Eric. And he was here as a missionary from Berlin. And what I thought, we had him over um, the, night, the night before he, he taught here, and his story was great, and he's telling us all about Germany, and you know, there's just a different culture over there. And we're talking about our culture and his culture, and he's, he's American, so he's, he's from here. He kind of knows both cultures, and he's telling us some contrasting things, right, some comparative things. And one of the things I thought he would get up here and, and speak about more was how do we reach people in Berlin? Let me talk for 90% of my message about how different Germany is from America. And then, of course, present the gospel at the end. And that's not what he did. I thought it was going to be this, I'm a missionary to Germany. How is Germany different than this cultural context? And how can we better support him? Like, how does this work in Germany compared to how does this work in America? And he stood up here, and he opened by saying, the people of Germany will know the gospel, and they will be saved into the kingdom of heaven by one thing, the supernatural, miracle, saving work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross, Christ being Christ, we need his work. We need his power. This is what we pray for. And of course, we can pray for other things that are more specific to how that strategy and how that week is going to go and how that that season is going to go, and how that culture will receive a different strategy from, from him. But it took me back, and it shouldn't take me back. I should be right there. The fact that we all woke up this morning is a grace of God. The fact that anyone would want to hear anything about any verse in this book is a grace of God. It's a miracle for us not to oppose him. So with that being said, let me remind us how much power God has to save lost people. Let's go to verse 11. Verse 11 says this. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So now we, we talk about that dwelling again in us. Same spirit. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So this is describing not just salvation of our souls, but sanctification, and then it actually alludes to our bodies being perfected by the time that the kingdom of heaven is, is arriving here. Okay, so it talks about first redeeming our spirit, and we have a new spirit, and the spirit of God is in us, and our bodies are still aging in this time, right? Our bodies are still aging. Eventually, we're going to die unless God comes back, Jesus comes back before that. So spirit gets redeemed first, and we still need God's help. We're still in a broken world. We're kind of in this in-between time. And then he's going to redeem the body as well, eventually. 
But what I want to take out of this for us in our cultural context and what we do with our mind being put on the Spirit is it's the same power as raising Jesus from the dead. We cannot undermine this. This is not about me being up here and giving you good advice about your morning rhythms with time in the Word or how to pray. I don't know how to pray. None of us know how to pray. It says later in Romans 8 that we don't know how to pray. We need the Spirit's help to know how to pray. We need an intercessor. We need help. We need redemption. We need a bridge. We need saved. We need deliverance. We need help. This is the difference between the camps and the polarizing mentality that we're surrounded in. And trust me, it is attractive. I mean, I can go to my feed, I can go to my YouTube, and it's, I mean, people I disagree with or things that are being inflamed, it's attractive to keep your eyeballs on there. You want to know why? Because people are making billions of dollars by keeping our eyeballs on that content. They are making a living hiring very intelligent people for us to keep our eyeballs on the social media, on the Fox News, on the CNN. Pick your outlet that uses advertising. They probably want you there more than they want honest content. So we have to just know that. That doesn't mean we don't look at the content ever, ever, ever. We need to know what the news is. Some people need to know what the news is earlier than other people. If your job relies on knowing what the housing market is doing, I'm not detracting you from that. If your job relies on knowing what is going on in, in the chambers of the House or the Senate, absolutely. Even as a citizen for voting, we need to know these things. We just need to know there's sin and corruption. Everywhere in the chain, in the courtroom, there's people. Wherever there's people, there's sin and corruption. That's my, that's my takeaway from the first part of the gospel. Everywhere, including church. Be on your guard. We are being told to put our mind on the spirit. And when we talk about people having their mind on the spirit or mind on the flesh, this is not to win and conquer and crush this is to woo people that are in the flesh over to the spirit. This is a different battle. Last week we talked about the battle is not against flesh and blood. It is not to conquer those other people. It is not to conquer the other side of the political aisle. It is not to conquer whatever camps I just said before. Action versus prayer. You could just set up camp. It's not to conquer the camp. It's to woo them into this truth. It's to woo them into the spirit and God's power will do that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So let me close with this. How, how does this all fit together? We're talking about power and we're talking about spirits. And at the cross is a perfect place for us not just to see Jesus, but, to, but for us to see this convergence, this convergence of spiritual reality. Something that we, I can go through my whole work week and just be completely oblivious to. Why did I get fired up that much? I've got a flesh. It's in here. There's also attack, external attack. Our help is from outside of ourselves. It's not from inside. Why, why is this such a battle? Why is this such a battle? I had a conversation with my wife yesterday. Battle. Big time. Not against her. Against my flesh. I'm just like fighting myself. This had nothing to do with the opposite opposing view on a cultural issue on the internet. I was in war against my flesh, being in the flesh, being in the spirit. This is where we can start the battle. This is where we can start every day. Do you struggle with physical pain? I'm going to go through a couple of these things. And, and I want to show you the cross of Christ is where we can key off of for all of this reality to come together. Jesus came, made a way, displayed who he is on the cross. That's the most accurate picture of who Jesus is. And the resurrection, he does the full picture here, but on the cross, physical pain, Jesus was tortured. He empathizes with those that struggle with physical pain. He went through physical pain. He didn't just tell us, here's the rules to conquer physical pain, here's the better policy it's up to you. Do you struggle with loneliness? 
Jesus was denied by his friends and rejected. Do you struggle with being overwhelmed and anxiety and having too much of the fire hose being thrown at you? Jesus asked for another way in the garden. He went to his father, still submitting, but he just raised a question. This seems overwhelming. I need help. What about being misunderstood and not having your point be highlighted in a way that everyone in the room or even just one person in the room understands so they can affirm you? Jesus was completely misunderstood. Times of correction, times of truth in love, also times at the cross where he remained completely silent. He gave his life up. He was accused. He was misunderstood. He was mistreated. What about more aggressive bullying or being mocked in the public square? It might be coming for the church. I mean, there, there already is difficulty in speaking the truth sometimes. What about people that want to harm you or your children? That's a reality sometimes. Usually, I mean, it has been a reality in a lot of the world and a lot of parts of history. Jesus was mocked and beaten. Jesus doesn't just tell us what to do better. He showed us. He did it. So he can enter into your suffering, whatever that is, whatever that is. The same power that rose him from the grave, the same power, if we're really going to express what we believe as Christians, that same power is available to us. So as we close, I want to, again, underline. Man's way, religion, religious boundaries, these dull tools that we can come up with of status, or God's way, which is not just these better laws. He does have a perfect law. He provides the power. It's not policy. We have a power problem, and he provides the power. So I pray that you would take that truth and see where you're needing his power. If you're a Christian, if you need help in your struggle. If you're not a Christian, I, I offer to you, Jesus wants to save you. He wants to save you. He did the work on the cross that will take your corruption, your flesh, and exchange it out with righteousness. If you have questions about that, we're here after the service. We're here all throughout the summer at 18 Bridge Building events. We're here in community groups. We're in small groups throughout the, the, the semesters. There's a lot of different ways I hope you feel like you can plug in to ask questions and continue to build each other up in the church, in the public square. Let me pray, and we're going to sing again. God, thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for giving us help. We need help, God. I pray that you would give us a mind that is set on the spirit and not the flesh. I pray that you would embolden us to keep each other accountable about where we put our mind and be honest. And I pray that you would help us wage the right war, which is not against flesh and blood, God, that we would be compassionate and loving towards people that might be pitted against us in some weird camp, but that we would just see we are all so broken, we are all so the same with how you've made us, and you certainly do not discriminate with who you save. I pray that you would give us the power for us to see and hear your word clearly. Amen. Would you stand and sing this? Hallelujah for the cross. Your goodness, I would 
be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness. Chase me down when I was lost. Where would I be? If it wasn't for the cross, oh hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, with your blood you bought my my song and all the glory all the power of the cross hallelujah thank you Jesus I was a prisoner now I'm not with your blood That is a good one. Let me leave you guys with this today. I've got verse 18. So just keep reading Romans 8. I mean, my goodness. Heirs with Christ, and then he talks about future glory. So I know I talk a lot about the sufferings of Christ, and we land on the cross a lot. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So there's a big picture here that God is continuing to work. And just as an encouragement, as you go throughout your week and you feel that tension, flesh or living in the spirit, there is a glory that comes from the sufferings of this world. Okay, I I pray that you would continue to see how this fits together. Get in community. Do it by yourself with God. Do it with each other with God. And we'll continue to get through the summer here. Go in peace. You're dismissed.